Magic makes a return to La La Land. LeBron James gets his man. A look back at the NBA trades. Jeremy Lin is back in Brooklyn, but will it make a difference? And stick around to hear who's on the bench this week. All that and more on What's the 411 Sports, coming right up. Welcome to What's the 411 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, it's good to see you as always. It's good to be back. I know. I hope you had a great week. Mike, you know, you're never too old to believe in magic. And it looks like the Los Angeles Lakers got an early start on spring cleaning by firing President of Basketball Operations Jim Buss and General Manager Mitch Kupchak. And replacing Jim Buss as President of Basketball Op Operations is none other than famed Lakers legend Irvick Magic John. Mike, do you think that magic could steer this ship? to return the Lakers to their previous glory. Absolutely. I think Magic Johnson certainly has his work cut out from Keisha. There's no question about that. However, what Magic Johnson probably should do here is look at some of the former head coaches and NBA players that have succeeded as general managers and, 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 and done well and gotten success in the front office, like Pat Riley, his former coach. Right? Look at Danny Ainge, what he's done with Boston. These are guys that are former players and coaches that have done very well in the front office. But I think he also look at, look at some of the negativity. Look at some of the former players that haven't succeeded. For example, Isaiah Thomas. Look at the former coaches who haven't succeeded. For example, Phil Jackson. And I think what Magic can do here is look at some of the mistakes that these guys have made through the years. And to finish, the recipe for success in Los Angeles, and this is going back 30 years, with the first dynasty that they created post the Walt Chamberlain era was with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Magic Johnson himself. They did that through free agency by getting Kareem to come to L.A. and by drafting Magic. Then what do they do? 10, 15 years later, they build through free agency by getting Shaquille O'Neal, and they made that great trade for Vladi Divas by bringing Kobe Bryant to, to L.A. So I think that Magic Johnson's biggest goal here is to make Los Angeles attractive for free agents to want to come there. And I don't think that's going to be too difficult. We know he has the charm as well. Yeah, I am ecstatic. I, from a, As a young little pup, I loved Magic Johnson. I'm so excited that he has actually come back to the Lakers. This is something that he really wanted and campaigned for a long time. But Jeannie Buss really was hesitant to fire her brother, Jim. And so I think that Magic, well, I know he's going to bring the enthusiasm and he has the passion to make the Lakers great again. He's got, you know, limited resources in the sense that he doesn't have a big star yet. He has a lot of young talent. And in his first moves as the president of basketball operations, he did make a trade to acquire uh, a, a draft pick. So, you know, he's kind of on the right right path and it's going to take some time and he's really made sure that Lakers Nation knows that this is not going to be an overnight fix and that look it took three to four years to create this mess it's going to take at least that or hopefully less time for him to even begin to write the ship to make LA a more attractive destination because we found that it's no longer necessary for people to play in these large markets like LA, New York, that you can be successful, build your brand in cities like San Antonio and OKC, Oklahoma City. So I think I'm, he's got the right attitude. He hired um, the general manager who was a former agent uh, for Kobe Bryant and many others in Rob Palinka. That was a move that, you know, maybe raised a little eyebrows because you have a novice as the president of basketball operations who hired another novice in, as a general manager. But it worked for the Golden State Warriors. Their general manager is a former agent. So I'm really excited. And we could see Bird and Magic doing battle against each other. They're both, you know, uh, different organizations. And actually in Indiana, too. Right. This is really crazy. So we'll see it. I'm really excited. And I hope that, you know, Lakers Nation stands up and is proud again. Well, we shift gears to the Eastern Conference, talking about the former, well, the NBA champions, the Cleveland Cavaliers, trying to defend that title. And LeBron James wanted a playmaker. It looks like he's got one, Keisha. What type of impact will Darren Williams have on this team as they go for the rest of the season? I think, if nothing else, he's going to give Kyrie some rest and give LeBron a rest from actually running the offense because between Kyrie and LeBron, that's who touches the ball and it really facilitates the, the offense. But he, I think Darren is going to be more than just a space filler. He is a veteran point guard. He's great on the pick and rolls, which is really 
you know, great and prevalent in the NBA and something that could definitely be used to the advantage of the Cavaliers. He can score. And I think that LeBron should be happy. This is kind of what he needs. And they got him for the Chief. They didn't have to trade any assets for him. So I think this might work out well and LeBron may have actually another little treat it's been rumored that Andrew Bogut may be looking to sign with the Cavs so I think this was a definitely a step in the right direction I think some fans in Brooklyn have a sour taste in their mouth and I say that because here's a guy in Darren Williams who was successful in Brooklyn for a period of time but we all know towards the end he was mailing it in and that's putting it politely and I think that there are some Brooklyn fans saying hey wait a second now this guy's getting an opportunity to go ahead and compete for a championship However, this is good for the Cleveland Cavs. This gives them some ammunition on the bench. And I think for LeBron James coming to Cleveland, this team bent over backwards to bring him back after he left them at the altar six years ago. And they've done everything and then some to make him happy, to keep him going out there and being able to contend for championships. I think that this move, and as you pointed out, if they can go ahead and get Bogut, this is certainly, I mean, we all know they're most likely going to wind up winning the Eastern Conference. But this is something that can put them over the edge as they get ready to play the Cleveland, the Golden State Warriors in the in the NBA Finals. I know we're three weeks, three months away <laughs> from that, but hey, that's that's the head, that's the favorite matchup that the people are expecting. Yeah, so we're gonna move from Cleveland and we're gonna go down to the Bayou, and there's a little extra boogie down there, and I'm not talking about Mardi Gras. When the the dust settled on the NBA uh, trade deadline, the Sacramento Kings sent their star, Demarcus Boogie Cousins to New Orleans Pelicans in exchange for rookie Buddy Yield, Tyreek Evans, Langston Galloway, and a couple of draft picks. Mike, who do you think, out of the teams involved in that trade, got the better end of the deal? I think that New Orleans did, but I don't think it's as lopsided as people are making out to be. No question. There's no question at all that Sacramento came away with some egg on their face with this situation. They had an opportunity to make a better out trade before this was done. They didn't. However, um, you know, you did get some talent here. I, I think Tariq Evans, Tari Tariq Evans, who in my eyes has been a bust throughout his career, you're bringing him back to Sacramento, but he'll give you something. He'll give you some energy. Langston Galloway, I'm not so sure what he's going to be able to provide. And Buddy Heald, I mean, the thing with him is that I just don't see the, the, the star power that other people think that they're going to get from him. But Sacramento, you really had to push this button and get rid of Cousins. Now, from the New Orleans standpoint, I don't think that New Orleans really made off like bandits here. Here's a guy in DeMarcus Cousins who has more uh, potential than anybody, and he has had a very successful NBA career. But there are times where the guy can become a head case, both in the locker room and with the media, constantly arguing with referees, constantly arguing with opponents, constantly arguing with the media. So I'm not so sure sure that New Orleans, who has not won a game yet with DeMarcus Cousins, is really sitting so pretty in this in this situation. Well, I think New Orleans got the better end of the deal. Um, Sacramento, say what you will about DeMarcus Cousins, he was considered widely one of the best big men in the game. And I think, from my perspective, they got about 50 cents on the dollar for him. And I... Going into the trading um, arena, I, I'm sure that Sacramento knew they weren't going to get dollar for dollar for what you mentioned with the off the field antics. But I would have hoped that they would have gotten more. And the fact that they turned down a better deal is ridiculous to me. So I, that's why I think that they really just got the worst end of the stick. And while uh, New Orleans did get better. It, I don't think the Cousins trade is was an instant playoff. You know, wasn't going to instantly put them in the playoffs or in contend contention for a uh, championship. But it did bring them closer, a little bit closer. They still have a lot of work to do to get the pieces around uh, Anthony Davis and DeMarcus Cousins to really begin to feel the impact of such that trade. And I think in, in terms of, you know, DeMarcus and his off-the-field issues, look, I've been in the workforce a long time, and there are people that you just, their personalities are just terrible. You don't want to work with them, but they're really great at what they do. So you don't necessarily throw the baby out with the bathwater. Is that the right way to say that? <laughs> but so it just becomes a challenge and actually test a coach and see how good they are and when you get somebody like Cousins because it's about managing him and how to and how to effectively do that to get the best out of him without stifling what makes him really great. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sport. Mike, what's on tap? The Philadelphia 76ers can't catch a break or maybe they have. 
Joel Embiid is injured, and Ben Simmons is done for the season. On the surface, it looks like the 76ers fans are upset. But should they be, Keisha? I mean, they definitely should be disappointed because this is the first season after years of misery and dismal seasons that they've actually been seeing some prosperity. And Joel Embiid was a big part of it. And then Ben Simmons being drafted number one overall was supposed to add to that. But we haven't seen Ben Simmons after uh, since the preseason, I believe. And then Joel Embiid has gone out. But I think what might be also fueling this the, the their discontent is the how the Sixers have managed this whole process, especially over the past month or so. Because you know, for years they tanked seasons to acquire all these draft picks and implored their fans to trust the process and that all this losing would not be for naught. That there was going to be a time where all of this would turn around and they would be contenders and maybe win rings. And Norlands Well was part of that. And now they traded Norlands Noel. And it's like, okay. And then what they got for him was essentially two second round draft picks. So here you are, you stockpiled these draft picks, chose him really high in the draft, and now you got rid of him. And what makes that move even more puzzling is that they kept Jaleel Okafor. And for the longest time, Jaleel, and even up to this year's trading deadline, Jaleel Okafor's name has been on the trading block. And they actually sat him down uh, for a few games before the deadline, presumably to keep him from... Um, having any injury or doing anything that would diminish his trade value and yet the deadline is coming on and he's not changing the jerseys he's there then you have Embiid he's gone and I think there was a little bit of mismanagement in how the Sixers disseminated that information I think that they made it seem as though it was less serious than it actually is and then so fans are thinking that any day Joel's going to come back and there's going to be more excitement and then you find out that he's pretty done for the season. So I think that, you know, they have a right to be disappointed, a little frustrated, but um, trust the process, I guess. <laughs> but they've made so much improvement when you watch them play. They actually do play some defense. They compete. They rebound. Uh, they lost to the Knicks by one point the, the, other, the last time they played at the Garden, which was about, you know, last weekend. So uh, there has been some improvement. I think only time will tell where it's going to lead this organization too but another story Keisha that came out a couple weeks ago or last weekend was the Draymond Green situation in Golden State where he just couldn't seem to help himself the last episode here was when he was taunting Paul Pierce when the Warriors beat the Clippers on a game that was nationally televised should Steve Kerr try to rein in Draymond Green or is this just a little case of Draymond being Draymond no Steve Kerr has to has to rein in Jim, Draymond Green. There's no question about it. But I think the biggest challenge uh, from my vantage point for Steve Kerr is to get Draymond to realize that there's a problem. He has these outbursts, and then to me, in the post games, he seems to kind of shrug them off or do a little shift blaming. Or was that? Yeah, <laughs> shift blaming. And so to me, it seems like he's, he doesn't see, take his actions seriously and doesn't see what the consequences were and how serious they can be. I mean, arguably, he may have cost his team the title last year by being suspended. And he needs to realize that he has built himself a reputation that he is not going to get the benefit of the doubt. And if he really is about being truly great and wanting actually to even remain with the Warriors, he's got to straighten this out because we just talked about DeMarcus Cousins and what some of his antics and what that meant and how Sacramento was really just itching to get him out of town and was willing to tra take less than what he's worth and we don't know could the Warriors be get to that point where they want him gone regardless of how how good he is well Draymond Green's just he, it's at the point where the guy's insufferable he's always causing controversy he's always hurting other players but I think when it comes down to it is uh you know they're just gonna have to I mean they've got so much talent that only time will tell what's gonna happen where how where, where this team is headed for the next several months Today we have a special guest. We have Nikolai Jackson, who is a sports enthusiast and NASCAR expert. So this past week, there was a big NASCAR event, the Daytona 500. So Nikolai, why don't you tell us some of your big takeaways, who won, and maybe some other things that we would want to know. Thank you for introducing me. Um, so the Daytona 500 was this past Sunday, and 
one of the big takeaways was the implementation of this new stage racing that NASCAR has put forth this season, which basically cut the race into three segments. And it really enhanced the racing uh, for the fans and for the drivers. Um, one of the big takeaways from the stage racing was that we had a lot more wrecks. There was 75% of the field was completely destroyed. And mm-hmm. in the end, Kurt Busch, uh, Stuart Haas racer, Stuart Haas driver, came out on top and ended up winning his first ever Daytona 500 for Tony Stewart, who just recently retired this past season, and he never got a chance to win the Daytona 500. So it was good to see Tony Stewart finally get uh, the Daytona 500 ring and a Kurt Busch come out on top for, for, his, uh, for his team. Excellent. So did he really go around the track 500 times? Is that what Daytona 500 means? Look, I'm a NASCAR novice, so don't judge me. So is, is that true? I heard that. It's not. It's it, 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 based upon the, 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 the miles, because it's 500 miles, 200 laps. So the one and a half, it's the two and a half mile track. So it's, that's how the math works. Okay. You mentioned the amount of wrecks that happened during this race. For those who don't know, how difficult is it to continue the race after you've crashed? Well, in, in the sense of for the Daytona 500 and for the super speeder races that we have, um, when the aerodynamics, if your car has a hole or any kind of like major kind of any, any major damage, your car will be slower than the rest of the field who has a nicely full, not damaged car. So you need to survive 200 laps without getting the car major damage any, any major damage caused to the car if, if you have any damage to the car you will your your performance will be hampered and you will not win anything you won't come you will have a good finish you won't have a good outcome do people not finish if it if it's completely damaged or do you just kind of plug it up with a little tape. i don't know tape <laughs> a little glue and st- stick you back out on the track well that used to be the rule now this year if your car was major damp if you had if you um had major damage, then you were considered out of the race. They NASCAR would not allow you to go back onto the track because you were considered a hazard. So if you had major damage, you couldn't fix it within five minutes. You had to go to the garage and go home. And that was, that was, that was the end result. So that's why we had a lot less cars finish the Daytona 100 this year because of NASCAR's other new rule, five minute clock rule for pit road. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Mike, might there be bullying in the WNBA? Former WNBA player Candace Wiggins has come forth in an interview stating that her time in the WNBA was toxic and she was the victim of bullying about her sexuality, which forced her to end her career quicker than she wanted to. Mike, is this a black eye for the league or do you think that this story will just simmer down? I think the story will simmer down. I don't think that it's that big of a black eye for the league. I think that this is something that people will be continuing to talk about, but I don't think that it's as bad as some people are making it out to be. One of the possibilities here is that Candace Wiggins is just an unlikable person and that her teammates and opponents just didn't like her and then she interpreted that as, oh, they don't like me because I'm not like them. Now, the claim that 98% of the Um, WNBA is homosexual I think is an outlandish claim I don't know where she came up with that Um, but I think that Candace Wiggins in some ways was out of line here however uh, what she went through you know I'm I'm completely against that I think that obviously there were some situations that she went on with in her career where she talked about hazing and being bullied and all that however there there's always two sides to the story and we haven't heard the other side because there's so many other players that haven't come out and spoken about what Candace Wiggins went after and spoke about right here in this situation yeah I agree with you I unfortunately I think it's going to simmer down because basically there has been there hasn't been anyone to co-signed with Wiggins on this. There have been more people who have come out and said that that's not their experience. And you you touched on the fact that maybe she wasn't likable. And I did read a, an article with, where they talked about a coach and she was, he said that she was known as a dirty player. So maybe that's some of the retaliation. It's really hard to say because I haven't heard any specifics. There were no names, no teams given. But she is coming out with a book. That's what the rumor is. And so maybe that's when we might find some more details about what's going on. And But the league should maybe start poking around a little bit just to see if there is some sort of bullying going on because you definitely don't want that in your league. That's never okay. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Mike, the Brooklyn Nets made a few trades prior to the NBA trade deadline and the Knicks stood pat. What are your thoughts about the moves that the Nets made and Jeremy Lin's return to the starting lineup? 
I think that Jeremy Lin's return to the lineup will obviously make this team improve, but with the worst record in the NBA right now, what the Nets are facing are the consequences of the past decisions that they've made in previous years Years when they went ahead and they landed Darren Williams and Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett. Um, but I think for the Nets, there still can be an optimistic outlook. I know that that's tough to say when they have such a poor, poor record, and when they lose this season and they go ahead and they, they the, the draft pick that they have is going to be lost to the Boston Celtics. However, Good things, I think, can be on the horizon. Kenny Atkinson has come in here. He deserves none of the blame for this atrocious record that they have because they really don't have that much talent. Um, but I think that things could be on the horizon for the Nets. It could take some time, though. I think Brooklyn Nets fans do have to be patient. But I think in terms of ticket sales and just getting a buzz at the state, at, at the arena up at Barclays Center, uh, with Jeremy Lin returning, there can certainly be a little bit more excitement than there has been over the course of the last three or four months. Yeah, I like uh, some of the moves that the, the Nets made. They did acquire some draft picks, which they desperately needed because, as you mentioned, their draft pick belongs to the Celtics. The draft pick that's coming in the, the 2017 draft belongs to the Celtics. So they made some moves where they could end up picking two times in the mid-20s of the first round. So that's, you know a move in the right direction. Jeremy Lin is always exciting, and I'm personally glad that they did not trade Brooke Lopez. He is one of my favorites. I, we get a chance to cover the... Brooke Baca. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't like the name. I, <laughs> I, I get where they were going, but I don't like it. Sorry, Nets, but I mean, we've got to do a little better. But I just enjoy Brooke Lopez. He just is a hard worker. He gives his 150,000% every time on the court. He's the anchor of that team, and just... Um, just is overall just a pleasant dude. He seems like the guy you just go and kick it with. Or, you know, the new Star Wars is coming out. Maybe we'll go to the, the <laughs> movie theater downtown and have some popcorn. They have a really nice movie theater where you get, like, adult beverages and, like, sandwiches and stuff. So we can see the new Star Wars or maybe the new Marvel movie coming out. But I like Brooke Lopez. I'm glad he's still here. And the, the Nets do have some work to do. But I think there there's a lot to be hopeful about because they play hard each and every game. It's just a matter of getting it all together for four quarters. There seems to be a little bump in the road always in the game that knocks them out. So we move on from the book and Knit Nets to the New York Knicks. And prior to the NBA trade deadline, there were a lot of rumors uh, surrounding Carmelo Anthony and Derrick Rose. Would they still be Knicks? Would the de deadline pass? They're both still in Knicks uniforms. What do you think about this? I think that what the Knicks have to do here, ride out the rest of this season. They're probably going to wind up missing out on the playoffs. And then once this season is complete, uh, I think Phil Jackson and Carmelo Anthony have to sit down, have a long talk, and find an option for Carmelo Anthony to get out of town. As long as he winds up playing in a New York Knicks uniform, he is never going to wind up winning a championship. And I think Carmelo Anthony has to be honest with himself. How bad does he really want to win? I think the best opportunity, if LeBron James is up for it, is trying to find a way to get him over to Cleveland. I think that the chips right now, the way that it aligns, it doesn't match up, and that's why you didn't see it happen with the Knicks making the trade to go ahead and get Kevin Love. Cleveland didn't want to get rid of him. LeBron might have wanted to get rid of him. But I just think at this point, Carmelo Anthony um, is is it, it's just not going to work out here. As long as he's playing here in New York, it's just going to be mediocre basketball after mediocre basketball. And as far as Derrick Rose is concerned, I think that Knicks fans were really excited about having him here, but they really wanted, most Knicks fans I spoke to, wanted to see Derrick Rose go wind up in Minnesota. They wanted Ricky Rubio to come here. So it didn't work out for them. <laughs> But I think what the Knicks just have to do is just write out the rest of this year and see what happens. I was thinking that Melo might end up in L.A. with the Clippers, but Doc Rivers has been really hesitant to blow that team up. He loves his team as presently constructed, even though it hasn't worked in getting them past the first round or at least to the, the Western Conference Finals. And definitely they just can't beat the Warriors. And I thought that maybe Melo would be a nice fit because the they need some uh, a consistent scorer and someone from you know who can shoot from the outside or can post up. But um, so that didn't work. And Melo's options are limited. He has ultimate say on where he goes. And if he also before I, I move on to that point, if he would have come to if he would made it out to LA with the Clippers, 
with Chris Paul, that might have lured LeBron James out to the Clippers because he's been really uh, vocal about wanting to play with Chris Paul and Carmelo. That would have been really interesting if that was the lure to get uh, LeBron away from Cleveland. But in terms of Derrick Rose, I'm glad that they didn't make the trade for Ricky Rubio. I think that would have taken them a step backwards. So we'll see. Derrick Rose will be a free agent in this coming um, in, the, in the summertime. And Melo, that story will probably continue for quite some time. But we'll see how it all shakes out. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. As you know, almost every week, we put people who are behaving badly on the bench. And if they're really misbehaving, they get in that doghouse. Mike, who do you have for us this week? Keisha, this week I'm putting the University of South Florida men's basketball team in the doghouse. After losing to Tulsa last week, the team left two of its players who had fallen asleep in the airport terminal at the terminal. They left them behind. The mother of Troy Hudson, Monique Houston Green, was not happy about the situation, and she voiced her opinion on Twitter about it. When you think it can't get any worse, they leave your son plus one behind, sleeping at the airport gate. Is there any other way to say you're not important? Wow. Um, you know, they must not like these two people, because it's not as though they were... They missed the bus to get to the airport. They were sitting at the airport with the rest of the team at the gate, and they just up and left. I mean, who are these people's friends? Do they have friends on the team? Because I think they really need to start reevaluating their relationships on that team. To so, and the coaches. I mean, I went to summer camp, and whenever there was, we went on the trip. There was the buddy system, number one. But not not that I think that you know young adults need buddy systems. But there was always a counselor in the front and a counselor in the back to make sure there was no strays and that everybody they took a head count and made sure that everybody got on that plane who is who white coaches really mm, this is not a good look for you and I don't know if any other mothers will send their their children to your uh to your establishment if you can't ensure that they get on and off the plane when they've been responsible for getting to the airport I think this is a situation where the coaches prevented the players from waking up their teammates and said, uh-uh, leave them behind because they were still asleep. Because the coaches were probably angry at the players for leaving, but you can't do that, 19 to 20, 19, 20 year old kids leaving them behind at the airport. This is a team you, you should be together. And I thought, with so many bad things going on in the sports world, I mean, yes, obviously, there are a lot <laughs> worse people and a lot worse organizations that we could put in the doghouse or on the bench. But I just thought that this was a story that would be a breath of fresh air from some of the sexual assault cases that we always wind up having. Yeah, and there's been a few Baylor, uh, <laughs> but stay tuned. We'll be right back. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Well, Mike, we have reached a point in the show that just frankly bums me out. We have to say goodbye to all of our friends. But don't worry, you can keep up with us by following us on Twitter and Instagram, friending us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 411 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, I'd like to thank you for joining us at What's the 411 Sports, and we'll check you out next week.